our discussion on the Old Testament, and I just wanted to spend a little bit of time kind of trying to help you connect the dots. Um, we will come back in, in a couple months, we'll come back and look at, um, you know, Exodus, for instance, has a good chunk of it that talks about uh, the tabernacle and the different parts of the tabernacle. And when you're reading those things, it can kind of get to be like, okay, why am I wasting my time with this? How does this have anything to do with me? So we're gonna, we are gonna come back and, and look at all the different things of the tabernacle and what, how that still applies to us today, and all that stuff. But um, that's gonna be in the future because we are gonna take some time off and uh, do a little bit more um, fun-based <laughs> uh, nights for a while. So the. We have a little bit of a chronology here. Uh, begin the beginning of everything sometime in the in the distant past, um, and then the flood happening and all that with the tower of, the tower of Babel. Now this starts the mass migrations, which can account for the Stone Age, and then that leads us to into the Ice Age, which you can see my time frame is a lot different than than um, most things you're going to see, um, and so the Ice Age, uh, the Native Americans came over, you know, obviously before 10,000 BC. So if we're if we're thinking that the Tower of Babel caused mass migrations, it would have had to be before 10,000 BC. As a result, then the flood would have had to have been before that. So we're talking about something somewhere in the distant past. Um, and then just to kind of bring us forward again in time, writing is developed sometime around 3,500 BC, and the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. That's when Abraham was in Egypt. This is during the Middle Kingdom, uh, around 2000, 1900, somewhere in there. Um, so that kind of gives us a, a little, you know, beginning. We don't know when the beginning was <laughs> because you know, it was somewhere back there. Uh, we don't know where the flood was. We don't know when the Tower of Babel was. Uh, we, we, we know when the Stone Age was, but we don't know how far back that went. We just have guesstimations. And then Ice Age we know pretty, pretty well, but there's a lot of theories as to how many Ice Ages there were or whatnot. I don't really want to even get into that. So the book of Job um, happens sometime around three to two thousand BC, probably maybe some close, maybe closer to around two thousand BC. Um, uh, we're, they're they're thinking sometime uh, around Abraham. So uh, we we're really kind of limited there. Um, so that's the beginning of Genesis there. Then Egypt has their what's called the intermediate period, where their government kind of just collapses on itself. Uh, this is the time of the Hyksos, which Joseph was was there and whatnot. And we looked at how everything adds up with them having chariots and horses and all that. It all uh, adds up there. Um, and then the New Kingdom of Egypt, that's where their where their government gets united again. They drive the Hyksos out. Uh, Israel is still in captivity, still uh, serving as slaves until. 1479 when the exodus is that brings us into the book of exodus itself um, and that's uh, shortly after this is when all the all these books were written genesis exodus Leviticus, numbers and deuteronomy now i said that job happened sometime around abraham so sometime around 2000 bc but we don't really know when it was written job could have been written as late as eight or seven hundred bc and there's really nothing to say that that's makes it not true i mean Saying that something was written later doesn't really matter much. Um, okay. Um, and then the conquest, the, their conquest when Israel goes into Canaan, that's sometime around 1439. So you can see how, how the, the flow is kind of happening here. Now, what's happening in the rest of the world? Well, we I didn't really want to waste the time with that. I mean, there's stuff going on in Greece. There's stuff going on. In, there, we're not going to look at that stuff. Um, but, uh, so, Okay. At this point, uh, so Israel is is going into Canaan. They're they're conquering stuff. That's right around when those books were written. Joshua happens right at this point when Israel is trying to uh, stake a claim on the land of Canaan. Um, the reason why Egypt is not mentioned in jo in the book of Joshua or Judges, we looked at this. It's because they were distracted with the Mitanni, and then after that with the Hittites in Turkey. And uh, so Egypt kind of just stuck by the coast, and Israel was kind of sticking in the hill country. And as you read in Joshua, it, it, it talks about that. So this is the context of the book of Judges and the book of Ruth. They both happen around there. Um, Ruth probably happened, uh, my guess is before Phil the Philistines moved in, but 
there's really nothing to say that. It's just that the Philistines don't really feature in that uh, book. So Judges uh, happens sometime between 1400 and like 1000, somewhere in that 400 year uh, window there. Uh, the Philistines move in and, and, and into Canaan uh, in 1200 after they get in a little bit of a scuffle with Egypt. Um, and then that's when Israel's, uh, Israel establishes the kingship, the, the, the monarchy, um, King, uh, King Saul, and we don't really know when he started, somewhere around 1010, and then King David from 1010 to 971, and then King Solomon from 970 to 930, and then King Rehoboam, and then that's when the kingdom splits. So, you can kind of see the, the, remember, Abraham is around 1900-2000, uh, Joseph is around the 15, uh, 1600s, uh, Moses is around the 1500s, 1400s, and then uh, Joshua, then at the same time, the judges are around the 1200s, a couple hundred years before and after. And then the kingship. So that takes us to the books of First and Second Samuel, who talk about King Saul and King David. Uh, they're they're pretty much the main characters. Uh, King Saul establishing his more chieftain rule, and then uh, King David, where, where the empire, I mean, the kingdom really becomes a kingdom, um, and then it becomes a mini empire with King David's son, King Solomon. Now it's at this time in the background, while, while King Solomon is is you know establishing his his little mini empire. Um, this is when Assyria, the Neo-Assyrian Empire, because there there was a previous, not really important. Uh, when the Assyrian Empire, the Assyria of the Bible, that Assyria, they start to uh, become an empire in around 930. So that's at the, around the same time that uh, King Solomon is di is getting out of the picture. He's dying and moving on. Um, and uh, there, there's other things that are happening, other power plays that are happening in Turkey and Egypt, but that's not really important because Assyria is the one who conquers them. So uh, this is right around the time when the book of Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes is written. Now, parts of uh, Proverbs and Psalms and um, possibly Job are written at this time as well. But they're not finished until um, until later. Uh, so that the books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles they talk about what's going on here with the different kings and the establishment of Israel. And then that takes us to these are the prophets that prophesied during this time. Okay. Now I'll pull up this next point right quick. Um, Israel is destroyed by that Neo Assyrian Empire in 722. So you can see that they've been a thing for uh, you know 200 years. Uh, they the so the Neo Assyrian Empire goes and then it kind of hits a little bit of a lull. Then it has a resur resurgence of power, whatever you want to say, and that is the context of these prophets. So Jonah is the very earliest prophet, except of the prophetic books. There were other prophets, for instance Elijah and Elisha, but they don't have their own books. Um, they just appear uh, in the books of Kings. Um, anyways, uh, so Jonah was during their – I believe Jonah prophesied during Assyria's lull in power when they didn't – when they weren't quite as strong right before they had that resurgence of power. So it, it would have made sense that they would have listened to Jonah with them being in a place of possible governmental frailty. Amos is around 760, Hosea around 750, Isaiah who prophesies over a period of time. Now there, there's there's most of the prophet pro, prophetic books they did not prophesy over a long period of time. Most of them uh, prophesied over in a certain situation, um, like for instance Jonah. The, Jonah was a well-known prophet in Israel. Um, he's mentioned in the Book of Kings. I mean, everybody knows this guy, but as far as the prophetic book itself, Jonah, it consists of him going to one place and giving one prophecy. I mean, that's the whole book. Uh, Amos is over the period of just a few years. Uh, Hosea, I believe, is uh, just a few years. 
Um, Isaiah, however, and Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and Daniel, they go over longer periods of time, especially Daniel. Daniel, I mean, this guy, he lived through, you know, every time that I think about, you know, oh man, I, I, I wish I didn't have to live through this, you know, or, or this. Man, I wish I could just skip past this point in history, or it's not fair that I have to deal with this. Well, then I think about Daniel. I mean, that guy had to go through a bunch of stuff. And I don't ever see him complaining in the whole book, which is kind of saying something. Uh, because, I mean, really, he, he, he was born in the Assyrian Empire. He saw Babylon, Babylon take over. He saw his homeland destroyed. He lived in to see Persia take over. I mean, he lived through a lot of change. Just a lot of change. So, okay. Um, uh, Isaiah started prophesying before Israel's fall and then went through till after Israel's falls because if they if Israel the northern kingdom fell in 722 you can see he doesn't stop until the 700s uh, Micah in the seven in about 700 Nahum now this guy um, 650 let me think I believe that 650 the Syrian Empire was was facing a major um, height of power, like um, a, a climax of, of their empire. Um, so things were going great. It looked like they were unstoppable. And then Nahum gives this prophecy. Now remember, Jonah had just gone to them, you know, the, a generation or two before. And here we have Nahum, you know, a hundred years later, and he's basically saying, "Well, you're going to be destroyed." So we, we're right back where we started. <laughs> and uh, uh, what was I going to say about that? Um, and he's prophesying when they're at the height of their power, which is kind of ironic, because they're probably thinking that they're unstoppable. <laughs> and then uh, within just within the next 50 years, they're completely destroyed. The The final des destruction of Assyria was in 609. So you can see it wasn't even 50 <laughs> years. We're talking about uh, 40, 41 years. Uh, 41 years after Nahum prophesied that they would be destroyed, it was destroyed. That's just... Amazing. Uh, Habakkuk, uh, this guy, um, he prophesied that, uh, you know, God, the, Israel is just such a wicked place. And he says, oh, you know, you don't know anything. Uh, I'm raising up somebody really wicked called the Babylonians. They're going to just do bad things. He's like, no, not them. Well, so that's that's where that where, where he comes in. And, and you can see Habakkuk's uh, prophecy was just a few years before Babylon's takeover in 609. Um, so we're talking about like uh, 21 years. Did I do that right? I think so. Um, and then Zephaniah in 627, and then uh, Israel. Uh, so at this point, um, Assyria is still the power, but um, Israel is long gone, and Babylon uh, has not yet taken over. Um, so it's in it's around that time. Uh, shortly after the northern kingdom of Israel is destroyed, that Proverbs is, is written. It, it's finished by Hezekiah. So probably what happened is uh, they had a bunch of King Solomon's writings and literature and, and Proverbs and stuff, and they just started putting them all together. And so Hezekiah, um, in his restoration projects with, with literature and whatnot, evidently he was an avid reader, I'm guessing, because he had a lot to do with this kind of stuff. So um, whatever. So he at the at the second half of Proverbs, it mentions that King Hezekiah was putting this stuff together. So he evidently got the crew got the got the crew back together. <laughs> so um, there's that. Um, and I already mentioned Assyria's height of power was in 650, uh, but then they fell within 50 years to the Babylonian Empire. Now, there was a few years before Babylon uh, makes their way down to Judah. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, after his father's death, had to go and kind of solidify things. He had a few things to, to take care of. But he found his way back down uh, in Judah, which is the only part of Israel that was left at this point, and in 605. And he takes a small group, and then he comes back in 597 to kind of... They're kind of getting a little bit rowdy, so he's like, hey, knock it off, guys. And then in, 580, in 586, they're getting rowdy again. He's like, okay, all right, fine, tear it all down. So then that's the end of that's the end of uh, Jerusalem, um, the holy city. But it's kind of a big deal uh, for Israel, uh, and that's what prompts the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is the entire book is about Jerusalem's fall. Uh, so it's uh, kind of a, a depressing book. <laughs> But uh, still, it's filled with a lot of mercy in the midst, or, or hope, hope in the midst of all that. So, 
Um, this is the context of Jeremiah, who started prophesying, you can see, while the Syria was still a thing, 627. And then down into uh, uh, when ba after Babylon has destroyed um, Jerusalem. Now, Daniel uh, is... His book starts pretty much right at that first Babylonian takeover in 605, and it goes all the way down to 530. So, I mean, he sees uh, Assyria's fall and Babylon's fall, and it just, wow, lives through a lot of stuff. Um, Ezekiel uh, is predominantly uh, about the Babylonian exile. That, that's it. He doesn't really he doesn't talk about Persia. The book ends before that. And he doesn't talk about Assyria. It, it begins after that. So, uh that's the context of that. And it's in it's it's somewhere in here that the book of Psalms is finished. Now, the book of Psalms has songs from Israel that were written all the way back from Moses, from King David, um, from people who served in King Solomon's court. I mean, it has a wide range of history in it, but it wasn't finished until sometime in the exile. We know that because one of the songs says... <laughs> While we were in exile by the by the brook in Babylon, so it's like okay, well we we know that it was written in Babylon then, um, so okay. <laughs> My guess is that they started compiling psalms into into more of a standard book book um, towards the end of the exile when when Israel was getting ready to go back into the promised land. Uh, so then Persia uh, conquers Babylon in 539, very short-lived empire. Or this is actually the Neo-Babylonian Empire. The original Babylonian Empire was a guy named Hammurabi and all that, but that's that's long before, long before. Uh, anyways, very short-lived empire. Uh, and then within one year of Persia conquering Babylon, Israel is heading back. So this is where Ezra and Esther and Nehemiah fits in. So that's, that's where all those books are. Uh, Ezra picks up uh, right around uh, 539, if I remember correctly. And then uh, Nehemiah finishes the story, but right in the middle of these two books is when Esther happens. Um, and it talks about the king there, um, who I believe was, uh, if I remember correctly, was the king who was actually fighting the Greeks uh, at the Peloponnesian War. I, I, I want to say that was the same guy. But anyways, so that's what's happening with Persia. They're over fighting in, in the uh, Mediterranean and all that. And uh, dear, what's happening for Israel is they're, well, they're being ruled by Persia. Persia gives them a lot more reign than Babylon did, though. Persia kind of had this thing of, if we let you go, you'll make peace with your God, and then your God will bless me, and then you'll like me more because I let you go to your God. And it worked. Persia had a lot of loyalty with their uh, underlings. Uh, Babylon, on the other hand, and Assyria used the other one. They're like, let's intimidate you and make fun of your God and make you feel real stupid, take you out of your home, take away your language. Let's just see if this works. And uh, it made a lot of angry people. Who would have guessed? I <laughs> uh, didn't see that one coming. Uh, so that's the context of Ezra and Esther and Nehemiah. Um, and that takes us to these prophets, um, which you can see right here that they start returning in 538. Now, Haggai and Zechariah, they both prophesy about pretty much the same thing. They're trying to get the people of Israel to finish the temple in Jerusalem. Um, it actually, it mentions them by name in, um, uh, Ezra. And then we have their, their books there, which I'm assuming is not everything that they prophesied, because if you read Ezra, it kind of seems to imply that they said some other things besides what's mentioned in them. So, I don't know. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Uh, Joel is sometime around 500. Um, I, there, there's a few other prophets that, that the dating could go um, two different places, and it would fit perfectly fine. I believe Joel was one of them. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, Joel could fit in the 400s or the 500s. But I think there might have been one other one. Anyways, um, Obadiah prophesies. He prophesies because Edom was um, just did some very immoral things uh, to Israel when they were being conquered. And so God sends Obadiah to them to basically let them know, no, God did not forget what you did. And they didn't repent either. So, you know, that was to Edom. Uh, and then Malachi in 433, which makes Malachi the last of the prophets, which brings us to... The intertestamental period. Now, what that means is it's in between the two testaments. 
the Old Testament and the New Testament. I know it sounds real like a big word. It's, 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 it's not. It just means between the two testaments of the Old and New. Now, this is referred to as the Silent Age. What that means is that there was no there there's no new revelation given between the old of, the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament when the Gospels were written. That's all that that means. Um, we we go through a long checkered history, which I'm going to mention in just a minute. But during this time, there's really not much happening uh, religiously. It's more of just politics. That's what it comes down to. Um, so, okay, let's look at some of these po politics. Uh, Persia and Greece are fighting. That kind of goes back and forth. Persia has some just crushing defeats. Crushing defeats. See, Persia had this huge fleet of ships. And they had this great idea of marching them all at Greece at the same time. See, but Greeks were, were excellent boatsmen. And so they decided to do this thing. We're only going to have a few ships. And sure enough, it worked. Persia's fleet got stuck. And most of them drowned and got sunk all by the rocks, and Greece had a stunning victory. Did not go well. Uh, if you know the story of 300. Okay, so, uh, okay, so then eventually a, a um, uh, not a mead. Um, it's there. It's there right by Greece. Uh, starts with an M. Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, one of the places that was next to Greece uh, has this guy, King, um, I want to say it was something like Philip. And then he starts, kind of gets the ball rolling, but he dies kind of prematurely, long story short. Macedonia? Macedonia, yes! Yes, Macedonia, yes. And uh, so King Philip ends up dying, and his son, Alexander, takes the reins. Who? And it turns out that he's really good at uh, fighting. Who would have ever known? Maybe King Philip should have listened to Alexander more than shooting off his own mouth. <laughs> so anyways, uh, Alexander the Great is what he becomes known. He sweeps over the known world. I mean, he, this guy just conquers everything that there is to conquer. And he gets into India, guys. He goes into India. And his troops finally say, not because they couldn't do it. They're just tired. So they finally tell him, look, dude, you, you need to calm the frick down, okay? Like, you've marshes all the way around the world. We own everything. There's a, just a bunch of Indian tribals. We don't want anything to do with this. Let's just go back home. And so he's kind of, you know, at this place of, of just kind of being stuck. He wants to keep going and just keep going and going and going. And his army's just kind of like, we're done. And lo and behold, he ends up dying. Just crazy, crazy thing. All of a sudden, he gets a fever and he dies. Really sudden thing. It was so sudden that he didn't have time to... Have a plan B. So his empire is just sitting there with him dead. And they're like, well, what do we do? So his generals, this is the long story short version. There's a lot more politics going at play. But what, what ends up happening is uh, his empire becomes divided between his generals, pretty much. And uh, this leads us to the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy about the kings of the north and the kings of the south, who were um, the Seleucid Empire and the... Um, Mm, the other one. I forget what their name was. Anyways, they keep fighting over over Israel, going back and forth and back and forth. And uh, just like Daniel said it would happen, that's exactly how it does happen until finally uh, Israel kind of gets tired of it. Uh, they, Long story short, they, um, they blaspheme God. Israel's really not happy about that. Ooh, they don't like that at all. So they revolt, and that leads us to the book of Maccabees. If you've ever heard of the books of the Maccabeans, First and Second Maccabees. This is when that happens. It is a history of of Israel during this time. Now, the reason why it's not in the Bible is because it's not really held to be inspired literature, just historical. Now, there are different books of I believe there's uh, eight or nine books of Maccabees, but only the first two are, are like I believe it's the first two are historical. Then they get into like mysticism and anyways. So if you want to read them, they're very interesting reads. But remember, they're they're not inspired by God. They're just they're just, you know, describing. Anyways, yeah, right. So that happens for a while. This is when the Essenes, or the community at Qumran, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees get started. So this is what this is what starts all that, the, the Maccabean time. And so those kind of become uh, more key players. Uh, the Pharisees kind of, um, well, let me just say, like the Sadducees are, are the nobles. Um, they thrive under uh, under uh, Roman rule, but uh, the Pharisees are more just regular people, and uh, so they uh, 
they don't they're not tied to the government at all so uh, when Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD um, just after Jesus uh, the Sadducees fall apart they just kaboot but the Pharisees live on uh, and they actually get a good a good thing going they they uh, were preserving a lot of the scriptures and whatnot really get a lot of things going uh, I believe um, the Essenes, if I'm remembering correctly, are the ones who the Dead Sea Scrolls. I believe they were the ones who who did that. Um, and it's a right around here that my history gets really not great. So uh, don't quote me on that, but I believe that's if I'm remembering correctly. So in 113, this is still BC before before Jesus. Um, the is <laughs> the Israelites go and destroy the Samaritans' temple. They're like. You guys aren't serving God. Y'all are just jacked up. We're taking your temple. So they destroy their temple. And this is after after hundreds of years of them going back and forth. It started, if you read in the book of Kings, when Israel is destroyed. And Assyria decides to move these other guys into uh, Samaria, which was the, the capital of Israel. And uh, they kind of try to, to mix um, Jewishness with their own pagan kind of thing. And so they do that, and Israel's just like, ugh, blasphemers. So then we get to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah when they're trying to rebuild Jerusalem. And the Samaritans are like, hey, yo, why don't we help you with this? And, they, and Israel's like, mm, nope, talk to the hand, get out of here. And so that doesn't go over well. They're like, oh. So then be, they become a constant thorn in Israel's side. And surprise, surprise, Israel didn't forget. So they keep going back and forth, having like this little older brother, younger sister squabble thing going on. And finally, in 113, they're just like, we're destroying your temple, and that's just how that's going to happen because this was an atrocity anyways. Uh, they start having all this all this internal uh, problems and struggles with, with themselves. Everybody's fighting each other, and Rome steps in to help. But as Rome often did, they never left. They went in to help, and they just never left. It's like, oh, yeah, by the way, you're now under ours. Us. Oh, I didn't know that that's what we were doing, but okay. So that's in 63. Now, this is right before Jesus, who's born in about 6 or 5 BC. Uh, the reason why he wasn't born in 0 was because the guy that they had make the calendar to put Jesus at 0, and then everything before Jesus was BC, in BC, and then everything after was 80, he actually counted it up wrong. <laughs> and so he was off by about 6 years, 5 or 6 sure. years. So... Uh, Jesus was actually not born in zero. So our calendar that we follow really doesn't have any basis in anything. It's tied to nothing. So, <laughs> so, so it's off by six years? It's off by six years. We should be in 2014. <laughs> That's the one. Let's no, let's go six it. years ahead. The virus is already passed. Oh. Yeah, that sounds like it'll work. Um, so, okay, Jesus is born in six. And this takes us into the books of the Gospels and into Acts and everything, and that's that's really uh, sets up the stage for for uh, for the New Testament. And you can see all the political tension. You know, you can see the Jews are are still upset about Rome just kind of taking and coming in and saying, "Oh yeah, we own you now." There are uh, you can still as you can see the the budding Pharisees and Sadducees um, still trying to prevent Israel from going back down that route. That led them to the exile. You can see the Samaritans still frustrated that their temple is destroyed. And then Jesus walking into Samaria has so much bigger of a meaning now. Or when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And the Jews are all like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Don't you remember how wicked they are? We destroyed their temple. And, uh, and then Jesus says the whole thing about, no, 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 no. It's not here or there. You're going to worship in spirit and in truth. And it's like, oh, well, hold on. And this is just way bigger than they ever imagined. Or when the Pharisee, when they were talking about King Herod's temple, you know, the rebuilt temple, how glorious it was. And Jesus says, not one stone will be left on another. It was in 70 AD, the Jews had yet another rebellion. It's like one after another. I think they had a total of four, if I remember correctly, at this time. And finally, uh, Rome just gets tired of it. Um, the, they would have been destroyed before 70 AD, but uh, obviously if you know your history with the emperors, with what happened with Julius Caesar and all that nonsense, and then with um, – what was his name? The guy that was crazy, King Nero um, and all that. Um, it was really a long history 
Um, Julius Caesar was the first emperor that, uh, well, he was the first emperor, and Rome was still getting to grips with the fact that they had an emperor. They, they didn't know. Everybody else knew that Rome had an emperor except for Rome. And uh, so, so you know, he Julius Caesar kind of sets the ball rolling with some things that, that kind of just kept mounting. And then by the time that we reach um, Emperor Nero, uh, I mean, the crowd just had turned on him, and it just, it was not well. So anyways, uh, the general ends up going back to Rome to make himself the emperor, and that's what caused the delay in the destruction of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD anyways, and uh, so that's that. The rebellion was squashed. Uh, Israel was decimated, and their history became nothing but traveling vagabonds who didn't really have a home, um, and that went on for a long time. So, okay, um, what happened after that? Uh, during the Middle e medieval ages, uh, they had the Holy Wars trying to retake Jerusalem. Um, after World War II, I believe it was, they gave Jerusalem back to, or some of the land back to the Jews, but they didn't give them their whole land back, just part of it. But Jerusalem is under a um, kind of a split deal. Uh, the Jews don't have complete uh, ownership of the city. It's divided between them and the Muslims, and it's just a big mess. Um, it's, it's just a big political mess. Uh, Donald Trump actually just made a deal, though, that seems to be great for everyone, except for, I believe, it's Iran. I think Iran is the only people who's not happy about it. But everybody else in the Middle East is happy, so we're just like, okay, all right, everybody just wants to step back and walk away. And also Donald Trump made it where uh, the U.S. Embassy was in Jerusalem, which was a big political statement, um, had a very significant uh, impact for, for the Middle Easterners and all that. Uh, I guess time will tell how that turns out. Uh, but that is, is what leads us into the New Testament. Any questions about what we've talked about with the Old Testament? As you can see, it's very, it gets very complicated, very, very complicated, and so much politics. And uh, I felt like there's some parts when you think that you're reading Game of Thrones. <laughs> so, um, nothing? We're all good? We're good to close this and, and move on? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So, uh, uh, obviously, the Old Testament was written, like, way, like, before the world started. Uh, so whenever the, the law was given to Moses, obviously they didn't have the, the Old Testament. What were they using? Um, well, there is a theory. There is a theory that um, that they had oral tradition. What that means is uh, in tribal communities, what they'll do is the older generation will tell stories to the younger generation. If that is true, then Israel would have had the stories about um, Adam and Eve. They would have had the stories about Cain and Abel. They would have had the stories about the flood, that stuff. Um, if that's not true, then they had nothing. And Moses was the Moses was the one we it seems who wrote Genesis. We're we're like ninety five percent sure he wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Genesis is still in the, up in the air, but it seems like he did. So I don't know. So that's what that comes down to. So is there a, is there an original maybe not an original but maybe a cop or something of the original law that was given? Hypothetically, yes. It's in the Ark of the Covenant. The problem is, well, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> Um, well, the second, uh, what about the second tablets? Well, that's the thing. The first tablet was crushed, oh, yeah. and then Moses ground it up and had them. No, 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 that was the golden calf he did that with. But either way, that 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 tablet of the law was broken. Um, I don't remember if he, what he did I with it after it was broken. Pieces, what is the um, I don't remember that. Uh, I don't remember that. I do remember that he Moses went up. The, up again and wrote them out again and that that went into the Ark of the Covenant. Oh. So hypothetically, if we could find the Ark of the Covenant and then open the Ark of the Covenant, we'd probably find it there. <laughs> so there is no, like, say, like a scroll or something that, that it's handwritten the law or no. whatever? No, no. All that we have now is a bunch of copies. Now this would seem daunting, except that the Old Testament is so well attested that there's really no reason to, reason to worry about it. We don't have any other old te old book that is has so many copies as the Old Testament. And then, like for instance, here here's just one example of what I'm talking about. Before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, which date to about the time of Jesus, so about 200 BC to 0 BC and around that that 200 that range there, 
Um, the earliest manuscripts we had of the Old Testament was written in 1000 AD. Oh, that's wow. after Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that's so, what we had. And so then when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, that moved it back a thousand years. And they started taking these scrolls and comparing them. And they were almost identical. In a thousand years, nothing changed. So that really tells us that it's very likely that the ones before that were unchanged. And so that's when it comes when it becomes very important to date it according to the events of when it could happen. So when I was talking about, well, this could have only happened at this time and they wouldn't have had access to that information. Well, that probably means that it was written at that time, way back then. So... Is that going to answer that question? Yeah, I was just curious, like, I mean, now we have the Bible, but back then, what did they use? I mean, I understand, yeah, you pass on from generation to generation, but information gets lost. Yeah. It's it forgotten, or yeah. you miss something. It's translated. Other yeah. than that, so it's like, well, why were they guiding by, you know? They really didn't. They really didn't have anything. That's what made the law so significant, is, you know, um, well, that very issue. We don't know how lucky we are to have the Bible, and that's why it's so ironic when we don't read it. <laughs> it's like all this history that was passed down to us, we've been blessed by so much, and then we just like, eh, I'll read it tomorrow. And it's like, uh-huh, uh -huh. what were you going to say? So is that how we're like able to see how like um, certain cities, they changed it when they updated the Bible with rewriting it? From the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Thousand? No, uh, how we can do that is because we can date when the books were written based on uh, the, the vocabulary that's used, the events that are mentioned, uh, historical possibilities, archaeology, uh, other historical, all, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then there's some things that don't fit that. Like, for instance, when it says Ur of the Chaldees. Well, that doesn't fit that dating. Everything else fits, but it wasn't known as Ur of the Chaldees. So then we know, okay, that must have been updated later on. We, that we don't have that from from that, but then we have uh, the Targums, the the Talmuds. I mean, just so many different things, um, which is the um, the Talmuds are the uh, basically um, the rabbis' uh, teachings and commentaries of the Old Testament. Uh, anyways, uh, and so that helps us to to figure that out. I feel like that that should be like a miracle in itself for. To, for anybody to start believing how it didn't change from the Dead Sea Scrolls to over a thousand years later, it's like very minor, like, very minor di differences, very minor. It's like yeah. almost impossible. Yeah. It's crazy. And then, like our oldest uh, 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 segment of of the New Testament, I believe, is from the Book of John, and I believe it dates to 112 A.D. So this is oh, okay. just a generation or two. And that scrap isn't complete, but it tells us that it was a scrap from something. Right. And w so that kind of pushes it back even farther, and then you can only get so far from the generation of Jesus. Yeah. Remember, Jesus died around the 30s AD, and Jerusalem was destroyed in the 40s, I mean, sorry, in the 70s AD. So during this 40-year fra fragment here, what happened to get this going, to establish a new sect or cult with Christianity, yeah. and where the Gospel of John was able to to develop and be preserved and have a copy in 112. I mean, that's kind of a that's kind of something that historically you you, you have to you have to account for that somewhere. Yeah. Now, obviously, I've way narrowed this discussion and made it way simpler than it is. There's lots of books out there that will go, I mean, thick books, talking about the preservation of the Old Testament. So just because I've made this a very simple closed book thing, I did that because I've read those books that are hundreds and hundreds of pages long. I'm saving you the misery. <laughs> but if you would like to... <laughs> There's books themselves just on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. Right. And, uh, and uh, so anyways, uh, great, great questions, great points. Anything else? Did I miss anything? Did I answer those questions? Anybody else have a question or anything like that? Okay, then we will shut it out. So we're going on an expedition to find the... Uh